meeting of the Pasadena Area Community College Tr Board of Trustees. Ms. Thompson, will you read the roll? Ms. Waugh. I'm oh, sorry, Ms. Waugh. Here. Dr. Selvage. Here. Dr. Fellow. <coughs> Ms. Brown. Here. Mr. Hillsman. Here. Mr. Martin. Here. Mr. Osterling. Here. Ms. Ma. Here. Okay, Trustee Osterling, will you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, welcome everyone. Do we have any um, introductions or recognitions? We have with us today the superintendent of the El Monte High School Union, accompanied by one of our board members who is also a faculty member at uh, Pasadena City College. Did you want to say a few Did words? Or? Okay, well we are now at public comment for non-agenda items. Do we have anyone who wishes to speak? Uh, yes, we have one very important person who has turned this in, <laughs> and that would be Dr. Perez. Okay. Do I, I just do this here? Okay, so um, we have three minutes to speak, and when the light turns yellow, you have one minute to speak. And so the light okay. is... Right yeah. next to, to Stella. Okay, great. And Trustee Martin will serve as our clerk for tonight. Okay. Well, they need 30 seconds extra, you know. Let's get it. good evening, Board President, uh, Board of Trustees, Superintendent, Cabinet, staff, and members of the audience. My name is Dr. Irela Perez, Superintendent of El Monte Union High School District, and I'm here with my Board President, Ms. Estela Torres de Sigres. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, we are here, and I have about um, eight items that I want to just briefly go over it, but I want to say congratulations to you for the decision that you made on your president's uh, superintendent. Um, from our part with the work that we've been doing with um, your superintendent, it's been very pleasant, satisfactory, positive. He is a great ambassador of the university and a great communicator and collaborator. We appreciate you very much, and that is a specific, the reason why we're here. Uh, we brought some parents, we sent some parents with their students to the college, and they honestly got the red card per treatment. It would be very, very difficult for these families to expand their choices to anywhere else, pretty much, um, because of the quality of human being that your um, superintendent or president share with our families. They were very impressed, not only with um, your superintendent, but with um, Dr. Bell as well. So thank you, and the rest of the staff, and that includes everyone who was part of that field trip. So please, um, superintendent, please uh, extend our gratification. So really briefly, I just also wanna say that um, we are here to thank the noticeable increase in articulation with PCC. Uh, Dr. Burton has been uh, to all to our district um, to our district several times. Uh, Dr. Bell, as dean from various departments, articulating with our educational service office on program grants and even field trips for potential students and parents. Uh, we want to say thank you to the Am Amtel Grant offering dual credit for students in our projects Lead the Way program at South Del Monte High School. We're also in the beginning stages of articulation with Yoshiko Yamato, professor of mathematics with the math, math team in our district, and the strong partnership with PCC Rosemead Campus Center. A large number of our students attend that campus and our former students of our district making this an overall win-win situation for everyone. So thank you. And the last part that I want to say, of course, I told her, what do you think? I work in this place and this is the best of the best. 
and I'm very happy. I was one of the persons who, who came with the parents and, um, and the students, and absolutely, you were wonderful. All your people were wonderful, and now our students, most of the students, they want to come to PCC. I don't know how you are going to do with all those students here, but El Monte Union High School District, the, our five high schools are very, very happy with the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Martin. It's been a pleasure to work with you and to have our students to get the best education. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to give that report and taking your time. And it's wonderful to have such a great partner in El in El Monte. And Trustee Martin, since this is your area, did you want to say anything? Well, just similar. It's uh, we hope a lot of those students are going to end up at PCC Rosemead, and it's a wonderful relationship. And you've heard how well it, how successful it is, and we just appreciate the collaboration there, and look forward to working even closer with. Uh, particularly Rosemead High School and that campus, but all the campuses, so thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to have a little procedural change. What I uh, asked is uh, Vice President Selvage to um, monitor for any of the trustees who want to speak to any of the agenda items. Did you have another question? Um, what's the question? Not, there's not public non-agenda. There is some for on-agenda okay. item E. Okay. So we'll move on to the approval of minutes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 3rd? I move. Yeah, Trustee move. Brown? Second. Trustee Hillsman, second. Any discussion? Any corrections? Advisory vote? Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We have approval of consent items. Are there any items that the trustees wish to pull? And we do have public comment on 73P. Okay. Would you please call the uh, speaker? Okay. Uh, first will be Daniel Weyer, followed by J Joseph Gregory. So as a reminder, you'll have three minutes to speak. The clerk will set the timer when the timer turns to yellow, you'll have approximately two more minutes, and he will signal you. Good evening, uh, President, Board of Trustees, and everybody else in attendance. Thank you for everybody here. The um, consent item I'm here today is the consent item of transferring assignments and divisions of the newly placed football coach, Tom Marr, and the removal of old head coach, Tom Kalmeyer. Um, with, this, with this move of assignment and change, um, when I looked into HR, there is a, moval, a removal of his, Tom Kalmeyer's assignment and putting Tom Marr, I'm sorry, Tom Kalmeyer's assignment and moving Tom Marr into the um, role. And this is a supposed to be a change of assignment, but it is a change of division because currently, I'm sorry, Tom Marr is a kinesiology instructor and not a coach. And this move of division is moving Tom Marr from kinesiology instructor into athletics, which is of currently two separate divisions. And they're saying that it is currently one, that they're joining it in the future. But as of right now, it is two separate. So with this, I feel like it is a unfair and very unprofessional moving because they opened the job. They flew the job on the Pasadena website for a new head coach and allowed applicants to apply for this position. And then after applying Tom Marr, they closed the application. And I feel like this is very, very unprofessional and unfair to every other applicant that applied for this job. Um, with that being said, I have a petition with over 120, it's 129 signatures by student athletes and student athletes only. The reason I ch choose to get student athletes is because this in our athletic division shows that it is unfair and that people can take what seems to be sometimes a back door to get a position instead of some coaches have to go through a three interview step process to get the job. 
Um, with this, it can happen to any sport. It happened to football. And after speaking to any other athlete, if it happened to their sport, they would be, in turn, horrified of it as well. We as athletes, we are student athletes. We go to school full time and we play our sport full time. Some of us even work part time to pay for ourselves. Our sport is our way of getting a better education. We use it as momentum. We use it as fuel for ourselves to better ourselves and our lives. And by changing a head coach, this is the third change within the last two years. Not only are we destroying our football program, but we are also destroying our kids because it takes a lot of time for sometimes for us to get close and build a relationship with the coach. And we had a relationship and we're willing to fight for our coach with a two and eight season, although it is very, a very poor record. With that being said, I have here gentlemen as well as people throughout the school that are willing to say that this man for the job, Tom Kalmeyer, is ready for the job. But if he's not elected back into his position, I would love it if the board could open the application process again and review every applicant for the job instead of letting an internal candidate just get it after a secret five-person panel meeting. Thank you. Can I have a I also have a petition. Am I able to turn it in to you directly, President? Give it, hand it to the uh, to Ms. Thompson, and she'll make sure that the board gets it. Thank you very right. much. For Thank your you very much. Uh, Joseph Gregory, how are y'all doing tonight? Um, pretty much, uh, we're all here. We're on the football team. Uh, there's a lot more of us that that couldn't make it tonight, uh, but we're here because we truly uh, care about our, our coach, Tom Kamar. Uh, and it's not just him, but the, the phenomenal job he has done in such a short time. I know the record was only two and eight, but uh, if you ask any of the football players, we really felt the change uh, with the environment and with the program uh, and just being more successful and having more opportunities as student athletes. Um, and this is not a matter of uh, just favoritism on one head coach or another. We're going to respect whoever comes in here, but being a student athlete, being at PCC for for over for around two years and being a person that's going to have to play this next football season um, and being at such a school uh, prestigious Pasadena City College who prides themselves on on students you know just all about the student take care of the student get the student out of here we just feel like the student athlete was looked at last in this situation just we were thought of last this is our third head coach in two years so there's not much structure there there's not much stability we just want to be we just want to be taken care of we just want to have the best opportunity, have the best structure, the best organization to, to be able to get our grades right, our football right, and get out of here um, to, to further our education. So this is not a matter of favoritism towards anybody, but we just see the, the true change in the environment, the true change in the locker room with Tom Kama, and that's why we're so persistent and, and adamant that we want him to stay. Um, this is no disrespect to, to the new coach, Tom, Tom Mahar. I'm sure he's a great individual, but we just want a fair chance for our coach because we feel like he's not given a fair chance and we feel like the student athlete has been looked at last in this situation. So that's why we're all here. Uh, no, that was the last one. Thank you very much for your comments, and I know you've met with Dr. Rudian, and hopefully yes, we'll have some answers. All right, thank, thank you. you. So, are there any, since there are no items being pulled for consent, may I have a motion to approve oh, the consent? I, I'd, I'd like to just, I had a question on 176B, and I do have a question on 73P. Trustee Martin, any other items to be pulled? Trustee Martin. Okay, thank you. Uh, 176B is a, a new um, energy management system and I was just trying to get the the overview as to the basic concept of what the system was doing for us. I know it's going to save us energy. I understand that, but is this is it like because there's a centralized computer that's monitoring rooms and temperatures and somebody's seen programs or I just the high level view would be helpful. Dr. Miller I'll go ahead and start, and then Ruben, if you want to fill in the gaps, you can do that. But we'll make this brief. Uh, basically, uh, 176B <clears throat> is about um, 
providing uh, an energy management system that actually functions and works on this campus. Uh, this building, this campus has been constructed over decades and there are a number of different systems that do not talk to each other, at least uh, uh, one or two that I'm aware of. Uh, we cannot even get parts any, any longer for these systems. And so this is an effort to standardize and to um, get ourselves uh, into a position of being uh, not only um, more sustainable, but actually providing heat when we need heat and cool when we need cool, as Dr. Verdian uh, has said to me in the past. So, Ruben, in a Reader's Digest version, can you add anything else to that? Yes, 176B is actually goes beyond just a building management system. We're actually looking at to improving efficiency with all of our heating and ventilation equipment, our boilers, and uh, any potential opportunities for renewables. So this is soliciting a consultant to aid in that and to actually um, make better use of all of our Prop 39 dollars uh, and looking at what projects we propose over the next two to three years. Um, to make best use of those Prop 39 dollars as well as the scheduled maintenance because we have a 90-year-old infrastructure. So is this just for the consultant that's going to help us make those assessments or is this for actually some kind of equipment? No, this is actually going to be for consultant to make those assessments. When we identify a project, we will actually come back and come back to, to the board and propose uh, an actual project to do something. That More concrete. Yeah, and the operative language here, by hiring an outside firm to evaluate additional energy cost savings. Mr. Martin, you had 173? Uh, 73P, which actually dovetails on the comments from some of the members of the, of the public. Um, I think it would be helpful to understand the process we used. Uh, I think it would be helpful to also for me to better understand under what, if any, conditions were was the temporary coach who's done it the last year. Uh, what was his, you know, what was said to him a year ago when he took on this position? Was he aware that it was going to come up for renewal? Uh, a little better explanation why certain applications were or were not uh, allowed. I'm a little confused on that. I mean, just, I, I realize there's a legal process we have to respect, but just on the surface, you know, a, a person who's been in a job for a year, and I don't know what kind of evaluation he had, and I'm sure it's not based on a win-loss record because that's not our goal here, but it seems like you would certainly, barring the legal things you're about to explain, expect that he, there would be an opportunity for him at least to apply. The so. current coach is on a one-year temporary contract, and his contract is very clear at the end of this uh, academic year. His contract is terminated, and there is no renewal for that. Okay. And was that clear to him a year ago when yes. he took on that this was assignment? Made, that was made very clear so in he, the contract, yes. So he knew a year ago this yes. was a one-year, and yes. there would That's be it. no yes. way of renewing. Okay. Because Ed Code also does not allow us to keep anybody longer than one year as a temporary person. And that was explained very clearly to the, te to the uh, temporary coach. What, and just to be clear, so it's one thing to understand this is a temporary contract is coming to an end, but it's another thing if he had, an under, had a clear understanding that he wouldn't be eligible to apply for the full-time position. If there is a full-time position and there is no internal candidate that is a tenured faculty member of the college, requesting for a transfer, then he would be allowed to apply for the position. Once there is an internal candidate that is interested in the position, then no outsiders, according to the faculty contract that we have, no temporary person and no outsiders are allowed, are, are considered for that position. So this is part of the contract we have with the faculty yes, association. Yes, that's part of the contract that we have with the faculty association, which spells out clearly the process that takes place at that point. Okay. And then finally, was there more than one applicant, one, more than one internal applicant? There was only one internal applicant, and uh, the committee that uh, was set up as per the contract and as per HR rules uh, determined uh, that they would move him forward and that he was the person that would get the position. Okay, so I'm going to play this back real slow because I can understand why the team would be upset. Quite frankly, it just doesn't 
smack right on the high level, but I'm also one that understands a contract's a contract, right. and we're legally obligated to abide by that contract, apparently. And so it's just an unfortunate circumstance this time around. It is. Okay. Uh, President Wah, I'd like to offer a comment on consent item 73P, if I may, before we vote. Sure. I just wanted to commend all of the student athletes, the football players that came out to support their coach. As a former youth sport coach myself, having coached uh, several thousand young kids, uh, the highest um, praise that you can give to your coach is to come out and support him. And it's unfortunate that the, the contract works the way it does, but I commend you for showing that support. I, uh, as a co former coach myself, you couldn't ask for anything more from your athletes. So thank you. And I'd just like to echo, if I may, that uh, you know one of the higher ambitions of team athletics is building on the concept of a team. And it's very obvious the current coach has done an exceptional job of doing that based on the fact of how you're conducting yourselves, how you've come together, and these kinds of things. And so, you know, I got to tell you, I am with you. I, I mean, I'm not going to vote against the vote to be illegal. And maybe it's something when we negotiate contracts we ought to talk about again. But, um, but I do want to commend you because um, I think you've made a very articulate presentation that made a lot of sense to me. So it sounds like we are bound both by the contract legally and also by the Ed Code on this issue. So thank you all for your comments, and I agree. Thank you very much for coming out to speak on behalf of your coach. So at this time, I guess we should have asked for some of the votes earlier. So we're going to take these separately. So I would like to um, first ask for a motion on item 176B, motion to approve. I'll move approval. Okay. Any I'll second? second. second so, motion made by Trustee Martin, seconded by Trustee Brown. Advisory vote? Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Take a motion on 73P. Move okay. approval. Made by, by Trustee Brown. Any second? Second. Second by Trustee Hillsman. Advisory vote? Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. On the remainder of the consent items, may I have a motion to approve? Move approval of all other items. Made by Trustee Brown. May I have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Osterling. Advisory vote? Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I do know that, that some members from the audience are asking to speak. So, and I apologize if perhaps we should have said this earlier, that um, we take questions on agenda items. They must be submitted to Ms. Thompson ahead of time before we hear the agenda items. After that, we listen to the speakers and then the trustees then vote upon uh, hearing the input from the comments. So thank you very much. Okay, at this time we are now on item F, the annual report from KPCC, Mr. Bill Davis. Madam Chair, Mr. President, the rest of the board members, um, I uh, submitted our report to you all um, early in uh, January of uh, 2016. Uh, it basically is an annual report of our activities for our financial activities for fifth, fiscal uh, 2015, which ended in uh, June, and then action, our, our activities, other operating activities uh, that went all the way through December. Um, uh, the report is relatively straightforward, um, so I'm here to uh, answer any questions that you all might have about that report. And then I can also update you on some of the things that uh, uh, we are up to uh, currently. And then um, I would also note, I understand that the uh, radio committee is going to be, has been um, 
uh, uh, created and will be meeting soon, and I'm looking forward to that meeting. But uh, basically here, uh, this is my opportunity to answer questions that you all might have uh, about the, uh, the station, its finances, or its operations. Yes, I, I had a question. Um, I, I'm on the uh, committee. I'm looking forward very much to working with you on this. Um, I was just, as a matter of curiosity, you mentioned the digital platforms and some of the uh, progress you're making there to yeah. moving out of the digital area. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give me a little, a little uh, summary of that? I, I, <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I can give you a little summary of that. Uh, uh, basically, I think uh, what we are, all of us who are working in media are seeing a transition uh, from the traditional over-the-air broadcast platform to mobile digital uh, platforms that are where lots of content is consumed either on uh, smartphones or on iPads and those kinds of uh, mobile devices. And we're trying, uh, I don't know if you saw, but 5G uh, cellular service is going to be coming uh, over the next couple of years, uh, which basically means that you're going to have ubiquitous Wi-Fi uh, all over the place. And uh, that has really profound implications for us. Um, uh, and what I would say on, on, our, on our strategy, uh, we are looking uh, both horizontally and vertically. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, uh, the horizontal plane, if you might think of it as the real-time stream where we are live. And more and more content consumption, there's a lot of uh, focus on the vertical consumption of podcasts. But the live stream that we provide is something that is incredibly important to uh, people because you don't know when an earthquake is going to happen. You don't know when bombs are going to start falling, et cetera. So that live stream is something that we're continuing to invest in. And then trying to get that balance right is, I think, one of our most uh, critical concerns. Earlier this week, I spoke uh, to our Board of Trustees. They had their uh, quarterly meeting, and I talked about the competition that we're having for talent. Um, there are a number of well-funded digital uh, players uh, who look at the talent that we have within our organization and make them offers that it's very difficult for a uh, you know, smaller 501c3 to compete with. And in fact, we're dealing with that uh, even today. Uh, so uh, from a strategy, uh, from a strategic perspective, what I would say is um, we will continue to make uh, investments in our live stream to make that as compelling as we possibly can, and then uh, utilize, uh, whether that be uh, grant funding or capital campaign funding uh, from our board or, or other major donors to make more investments in uh, that uh, digital uh, depth that you would have in, in podcasts. Great. Well, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the continued partnership with Pasadena City College and cross-fertilization as we can develop it, um, in the, especially in those areas of digital technology that are, that are the future. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And I, uh, the one thing I would also note there is, um, you know, we had uh, what I would consider to be a pretty strong year last year with, uh, with, with internships, um, not so much from a numbers perspective, but from a quality perspective, a little bit more in the numbers uh, in, in, in the current uh, uh, year. And, um, you know, the kids who are coming into uh, PCC now into all colleges are basically digitally native. And that uh, digital nativity uh, allows them to intuit things that, you know, uh, non-digital, non-natives um, uh, like me struggle with, right? So uh, having that kind of energy, enthusiasm, and creativity is something that we very much value. Well, I wanted to mostly compliment you for the report. Uh, first and foremost, it was clear and concise. And any, this is, I know the team's working on these two words, clear and concise. <laughs> but I really appreciate clear and concise and a couple pages and boom, and it's here. I appreciate having the financials that parallel the report that makes sense to me. Uh, I appreciated the fact that the goals were measurable, and I also appreciated the fact that you didn't exactly make every single goal, which means <laughs> that you really made good goals. Because if you slam dunked every goal, what? that wasn't really a goal. So 
the, the mere fact that, you know, there's better financial years and not so better financial years and things happen shows me that these were really good goals and things that you're measuring. I appreciated all of that. Love the pictures. Of course, the most important thing to me is the student involvement, and I know it was a good year for that. And I have one small request sure. that I wish you would consider. Next year in those incredible goals, if there was one goal that involved Pasadena City College, and in particular maybe even students in the goals, that would sure warm my heart. Okay. So noted. And um, but I thought it was a great report. Thank you. And we are in the process of doing that currently. Uh, that's something that I do with our strategic planning committee, and I will certainly uh, bring that up. And, and when we talk with the radio committee, we can look at uh, one that would be a, an actionable goal that would uh, have significance for the uh, the college and the uh, uh, the station. Okay. I'm not on, excuse me. I'm not on the. Uh, uh, committee, so I won't have this opportunity to ask you in the committee, but you mentioned sure. the profound implications. Could you just highlight a couple of those specifically? Uh, well, um, changes that we're going through and sure. Well, so for example, um, I, I was just looking our um, so our audience in January uh, all told uh, was uh, roughly around 800,000 uh, weekly listeners. And that's stretching from Santa Barbara to um, Orange County, from uh, you know the westernmost part of Los Angeles to the uh, uh, Coachella Valley. Broadcast, um, broadcast over the air. So that's well. So um, that, that's eight hundred thousand of that, or eight hundred and thirty thousand of that. Um, almost eight percent, sixty-six thousand, are streaming on their uh, phones or digital devices. So um, when I came to, uh, to, to KPCC, uh, our over-the-air broadcast audience was about 220,000 uh, weekly listeners. So, um, and there were zero digital streamers. And, and so now uh, the growth of that digital stream is, is continuing. And I think I, you know, I, I'm not in the business of, of, of predicting where an inflection point is going to happen. Uh, but my guess is that that digital stream is going to continue to increase um, even as we try our best to make sure that we, can, that we have growth on the broad broadcast platform. But I, I think the other uh, aspect of, of that digital, um, uh, the digital revolution is that it gives us the opportunity to focus on uh, particular uh, communities uh, that we might not be able to do in our uh, uh, real-time stream. So, for example, we might be able to do uh, podcasts in Mandarin, in Spanish, in Tagalog, um, that uh, would draw on the content that we have created in English, but serve other uh, population groups uh, uh, in, you know, in this area specifically, or uh, maybe even beyond. Um, and and, and you know, those kinds of flexibilities exist uh, when you don't have the real-time pressure of a uh, of, of a broadcast stream. So I, those would just be two that I would uh, that I would draw your attention to. But uh, right now, what's top of mind for me is uh, you know talent, you know, attracting and retaining really talented producers and and journalists um, when you're trying to compete with Amazon.com and Audible. Mm -hmm. um, it's really tough to match their deep pockets. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. And as I said, the last time you presented um, San Marino Rotarians, it said this is the best radio station they've ever heard. So uh, Mr. Davis has graciously agreed to come and speak to San Marino in March, and I invite my colleagues to come and hear him if they wish. No other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And again, I look forward to uh, meeting with all of you on the committee. Okay. At this time, we are on item G, approval of modifications and deletions to the credit curriculum. Superintendent Verdian. Right. So we're asking the board to approve the archiving, the additions, and also some of the changes that we're making to the uh, GE requirements for our associate degrees and uh, for transfers. Do you need a motion? Are there, there any questions? Would that help? Oh, I'll okay. move, Are there any motion? move approval. Move by Trustee Martin. Is there a second? 
I'll second. Seconded by Trustee Osterling. Is there any discussion? May I call for advisory? Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? This item passes unanimously. Okay, at this time we are on information items. Item H, the accreditation update, President Verdian. As you know, uh, we have to address the nine recommendations that uh, the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges uh, gave us this past uh, July. And the college has been working very closely under the leadership of uh, Dr. Scott, uh, Lenora Rogas to address all nine recommendations. Today we sent out to the college community the first draft of the way the college is addressing those recommendations. The college community at large has through March the 18th to submit their feedback to the committee. And what will happen after that is Dr. Scott and Dr. Rogas will work with the nine work groups to look at the feedback that we receive from the college communities, including our very own board of trustees, and then the, we'll work towards developing the final draft of the address of those recommendations. And today, Dr. Scott and Dr. Rogas will give us a brief aperçu, if you want, of what we have done with the nine recommendations. What are the highlights of the way we are addressing those nine recommendations? Thank you, Dr. Verdian. We're very pleased to be here tonight to go over the uh, recommendations with you and where we stand at this point. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Lenora Rogas to you. She is the new faculty accreditation coordinator and she came in f very recently and has done just a fabulous job. Um, she's been working very long hours to make sure this was put together and I am enormously appreciative. And I'd also like to thank Stephanie Fleming who put together the very first first draft and she also put in a lot of hours and worked very hard. Um, and like we said, this is a draft. We've already noticed several things in here we need to fix, um, but we'll go ahead. All right, the first recommendation having to do with integrated planning. Uh, we created, approved, and followed the integrated planning model. Uh, the campus engaged in annual program review updates, and we're happy to say that 91.6% of programs participated in that effort. Uh, the process was also evaluated and campus, the campus community was very pleased with the training and the support they received in particular. After that, it went, the program review prioritizations and the request for resources went through the prioritization process in connection with the college's strategic plan. The deans prioritized within their areas and sought input from faculty, after which the vice presidents or executive directors prioritized the next level and in collaboration with faculty and staff. And for instructional equipment, um, the academic affairs area worked collaboratively with facilities and technology, as we did last year also very successfully. The executive committee then provided further input on the prioritizations, and we engaged on February 5th in the annual budget retreat, which was well attended by members of the academic senate, classified senate, associated students, uh, budget committee members, accreditation committee members, facility staff, technology staff, and there was a very nice article in the Courier. Um, and at this point, a tentative budget will be developed that's informed by the program review process. Budget presentations will, will be made to the campus beginning in spring, and after we've gone through this entire year's process, we'll evaluate and revise the integrated planning process for next year. Uh, recommend, recommendation two had to do with evaluations and making sure that they're up to date. A master checklist was created to help us track them in a better manner. Timelines for each employee group were clarified so we know when they're all due. Managers were instructed to complete all evaluations and they are doing so and we are tracking them very carefully. Changes are being made to ensure that we don't have this situation again and that we're in compliance going forward. Banner is now being used to track evaluations electronically. Evaluation instruments have been verified or revised for clarity. 
and they will be put on the website so everybody knows what the evaluation instruments are. HR will be sending a master list twice a year to the managers, once in May and once in November, so that we're all clear. One HR staff member will handle the intake and tracking of evaluations rather than it being handled by multiple people. And as Verde, Dr. Verdian has made clear, the managers will be held responsible for ensuring that, that evaluations are kept up to date. And it's also in the AP and in their own evaluation that they have to keep evaluations up to date. Recommendation three had to do with evaluations, but the insurance of SLOs in those evaluation documents. Firstly, we needed to create a consistent adjunct evaluation process, which we have done. An MOU was also written to clarify that process, which we are currently using. Full-time responsibility and adjunct responsibility is clarified in that MOU also. When adjuncts are asked to participate, they are compensated, and that has been approved. That MOU has been approved. The district has committed significant financial resources to ensuring that this process was adhered to. We are, like I said, paying adjuncts. There's an MOU in place to do that. We have paid leads this semester, so we have people, faculty across the different areas, helping other faculty to understand the process where they may not understand it well enough and to get all the forms and documents in. SLO assessment as appropriate has been clarified in faculty, classified, and management evaluation forms with all of them being revised appropriately. Um, I would also like to add that 92% of our courses are now being assessed. It's a significant improvement over where we were a few months ago. We have wide participation on the part of both adjunct and full-time faculty. Recommendation four had largely to do with concerns regarding ethics, and so the starting point was to isolate our problems. The ethics work group determined that we needed to establish a cohesive ethics policy that was universal for the entire campus. We also determined that evaluation processes needed to be included into the administrative procedures so that if there were alleged ethics violations, they could be addressed through the appropriate channels. And then finally, increased awareness on campus regarding our ethics policies um, and just some general guidelines by which the campus should abide. And so one of the first things that we did was to put into creation a universal ethics statement that applies to the whole campus, and that has been vetted by various shared governance groups and approved by almost all of them. It's currently in college council um, for approval. Upon reflecting on the uh, administrative procedures, it was realized that the Board of Trustees had already modified its board policies regarding ethics and added in that evaluation component for um, potential violations of ethics policies. The Ethics Works group, work group then directed the various other constituencies on campus to do a similar sort of review. It was realized that faculty in their ethics AP already has this procedure in place, but faculty were still advised to take another look at their ethics uh, procedures to make sure that they are um, up to par. Management and classified currently have no uh, procedure for addressing ethics violations, and so the, they are currently working on updating and revising their ethics AP so, to make sure that those procedures are in place. Recommendations were also put into place for faculty and leaders um, institutionally for training in ethics. The recommendation for faculty was for faculty leaders, including chairs of committees and academic senate members to receive training in governance and academia, in ethics and conflict resolution. For chairs, we hope that this uh, training will become mandatory. For institutional leaders, including members of co college council, um, there was a recommendation for training regarding uh, leadership strategies, conflict resolution, and for managers in particular, HR had requested that there be additional training for how to deal with complaints and uh, through the appropriate HR channels. Constituency, constituency groups are also being asked to create meeting norms so that, it, that are specific for their group so that there's a sort of guideline for behavior in, in various meetings, and that should hopefully help create more collegial environment during these meetings. Coffee and conversation sessions are being uh, established through the governance work group between faculty leaders and various administrators just so that we get to know each other on a more personal level rather than um, sort of conceiving of each other as adversaries, conceiving of each other as colleagues and potentially friends. And then the campus climate survey, which is actually already in its, a great draft form, 
now includes a very strong ethics component so that we can use the current campus climate survey that will be administered in the spring of 2016 and use that as a basis of comparison to last year's campus climate survey to see where we still need improvement and what improvements have been made. Regarding organizational structure, there was a proposed new organizational structure and it was again vetted through the various shared governance bodies. Input was solicited and changes to that academic structure proposal were made based on that input. One of the primary uh, concerns was that there may be inadequate support for the new division structures. Within the new academic organizational structure, there will be 12 divisions, and we wanted to ensure that each of those divisions had adequate support. And so now each division will have an administrative assistant as well as a clerk to offer that support. We have five academic dean positions that will, are being filled, as well as the student affairs management positions, and then the assistant superintendent, vice president of instruction. And that's going to be filled and begin uh, July 1st. For professional development, probably one of the most significant improvements was the creation of a uh, centralized body on campus to, that, that can sort of coordinate all of the uh, smaller professional development committees. This college-wide committee is not only responsible for coordinating the subcommittees, but also managing a centralized website. That way, the entire campus community has access to professional development opportunities and can register for those opportunities online and be used as potentially a tracking system to see who's completed these professional development opportunities. A needs assessment survey was just completed recently, spring of 2016, and the summary for that report or that survey has already been um, put together and that is being used as a baseline to create further professional development opportunities later on this semester. The, as you know, the board policy and the administrative procedure 7160 were approved and that's just a formalization of PCC's commitment to continuing with excellence in professional development opportunities and training on campus. We're continuing with training this spring. Significant improvements include training the campus community on new accreditation standards training the campus community on SLO assessment and how to effectively implement SLO improvements in the classroom, uh, governance and ethics, which I already mentioned, and then we're continuing on with our equity, diversity, and cultural competence theme, including a great panel that will be established this spring on open educational resources to help assist our low-income students. For the governance recommendation, we have a lot of exciting changes coming out of that, that work group. One of the strongest recommendations was to the various constituency groups to review their administrative procedures on governance. And coming out of classified and faculty senate or academic senate was a strengthening of language that increases communication between the board of trustees and those constituency groups. Uh, potentially in times of conflict, but really to help explain why different decisions were being made. And hopefully through that increased communication, uh, the faculty and the classified will have a better understanding of the rationale behind uh, many of the decisions made on campus. We made a recommendation as well for increased appreciation of faculty and staff who participate in shared governance roles. And that uh, recommendation was made to executives and managers. We also recommended annual training for college council as well as faculty leaders, which I also mentioned before. The shared governance committees are now creating annual goals and required to complete annual self-evaluations, particularly the standing committees of college council are required now to report back to college council annually on their progress and evaluate themselves against their own creation of goals. We wanted to increase the emphasis on shared governance and the importance of that on campus. And so shared governance is really emphasized now in job descriptions, job announcements, and job hiring interviews to make it clear to all incoming faculty and staff that there is a shared governance responsibility on this campus. We are also encouraging uh, division deans and managers to emphasize shared governance participation in activities more during division meetings. And then also in performance evaluations um, to report shared governance participation positively in performance evaluations. Campus communication is being increased through the use of a common communication tool so that different um, representatives on shared governance groups have an electronic as well as hard copy mechanism by which they can report back to their constituents about what's happening in various committees. We're also making sure that increased communication happens through the Inside PCC newsletter and the presidential forums.
Recommendation eight has to do with evaluation and it overlaps with most of the other recommendations because all the changes that we make need to be evaluated for possible improvement. Because of the overlap, we created a leads group. So the leads of each of the recommendation groups meets every other Friday afternoon and uh, we talk about all the recommendations and how we're working together and make sure that we all understand what the other group is doing. The evaluation group has been involved with the governance structures in terms of helping to evaluate policies and procedures of the constituency groups. And it's also been involved in looking at the role of the College Coordinating Council and how that can be revised to be more effective. And as Lenora said, um, the Shared Governance Committees all create annual goals now and self-evaluation, and that's part of the evaluation group. And they've been supporting other rec the other accreditation work groups, such as integrated planning. We need to be sure that we integrate, I'm sorry, that we evaluate the annual update process, which we have done, and the entire integrated planning model after we go through the first year. They've also been helping with professional development in terms of the needs assessment survey. We will evaluate the website when that's up and see how well that's working for the community, the campus community, and also, also the various workshops and trainings we'll need to evaluate. And any others that may, may be need assistance, such as after we've had the new organizational structure in place for a semester or a year, we will want to evaluate that also. And as Lenora said, we'll be doing the campus climate survey in April and we'll be able to compare our results to last year, which is very important for us. Um, and perhaps mostly this group is gonna help the college community understand the importance of evaluation in terms of the accreditation standards and the need to continuously improve. And recommendation nine is student affairs. They have created a plan for program review, for annual updates, and for the SLO assessment process. And I'm pleased to say that they have 100% participation on their SLOs and their annual updates. They have created SLOs where needed and established a timeline to make it very clear that they have a plan in place. The plan would, will ensure that all elements of the recommendations will be met on an ongoing basis, and that was what the recommendation had asked. In terms of future actions, as Dr. Verdian said, the follow-up report was made available to the campus on Monday. <clears throat> Planning and priorities, which also serves as the accreditation steering committee, um, met today and went over the first part of the report and had some suggestions for improvement. Uh, we had the electronic feedback from the campus until March 18th and then the Board of Trustees feedback until the March 18th. Then the revised report will go through the constituency group process. Uh, later in the spring in April, we'll have another round of accreditation forums, another accreditation newsletter, and ultimately final approval by PNP, Accreditation Steering Committee. Then it will go to the board for approval. It will be submitted to AC ACCJC in late September, and we will be visited by team members in November of 2016. Okay. That's it. Any questions from the trustees? Yes. Dr. Selvich, please. Back on uh, slide number four. Uh, slide number four. Yeah. Oh. Right. The, the second bullet point, could you describe that again? Yes. The MOU that was created made it clear that SLOs are the responsibility of full-time faculty as part of their regular job. And it also said that it, adjuncts for adjuncts it's extra work and they will be paid if they're asked to participate in the SLO effort. We don't have to assess every single section of every course. Say for example we have 50 sections of English 1A. We don't have to assess every single section. We have to get a representation and so where we need adjuncts to assess, in some cases the course may only be taught by an adjunct so we need that support. Um, and in some but cases, the pay, what you're saying is we pay them extra to do that SLO. Okay. That assessment, correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And on uh, slide 10, the right on slide 10 here for these student affairs, there are going to be SLOs. Is that the uh, uh, the way in which? the various elements, and there are a whole bunch of programs here. Is that how they will be measured, whether or not they're meeting uh, uh, 
some required level of performance, and if not, we figure out to change something or do something different? Yeah, in the case of student affairs, what we're doing is, for the most part, getting student input on how, they, on how they're doing with perhaps filling out financial aid forms, um, how they feel customer service is occurring in admissions and records. So for the most part, theirs are, they're, theirs are different. They're more surveys that can be customer satisfaction type of things. Uh, customer feedback. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Correct. It, may, and it could be like some kind of an administrative unit outcomes. I mean, uh, Dr. Scott mentioned that financial aid could be uh, stu uh, students waiting in line to meet with a financial aid counselor will not meet, will not wait for more than 10 minutes. So, and then we'll see how we can improve on that. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? I have a couple. Mr. Martin. Well, oh. I'm happy to follow you. No, no. Um, well, first, <laughs> tremendous kudos to everybody for a lot of hard work and putting all this together. And it's obvious. There's a lot of good things happening here. Um, I had one concern. I, I kind of sent it to the superintendent in a little more detail, but I feel like I ought to, in fairness to you, let you know this is coming from me. And it it's centered on recommendation seven in, in the book we were given. And um, it's hard because there's not page numbers, but just to sum it up succinctly. We're sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. But one of the suggestions was have page numbers. But the second suggestion was uh, to sum it up succinctly, there's a sentence in here uh, that over the last year, issues between the faculty and the Board of Trustees have remained an area in need of improvement. And then it goes on about the Academic Senate. And so I'm going to try to say what I'm about to say clear and concise, because I like people that do that. And I'm also going to try to say it extremely respectfully. but. To, to anyone who has observed a few board meetings back a few years ago now, at the center of probably the biggest problem in accreditation that rippled through everything else was uh, a conflict, at, to use the word politely, between the former superintendent president and some academic leadership. And it is my opinion, in being one who attended all those board meetings, that that particular conflict was the center of the issue that highlights over the last few years there's been a conflict between the faculty and the board of trustees. And to not mention in some ever so polite way that that conflict existed and has, and obviously the board in obvious ways has rectified its part and it's obvious that the academic institution has made a tremendous effort to rectify their part. So I think we're missing something in the gap here that needs to be said so that we're not creating a revisionist history that was like talking about the recent uh, my example is it's like we we're talking about the recent history of China and we didn't mention anything about the conflict between Mao and Chiang Kai-shek. You know, I don't mean we have to mention names, but it's also a testimony to the institution that actions were taken both ways to help bring all that to people who wanted to come together and do it. So. I kind of politely ask that there be an insertion in here that explains it wasn't just the board and the faculty. There was a common cause in the middle that kind of precipitated right. some of that. I well, would ask that you consider mm -hmm. that. Trustee Martin, your point is well taken. We will take that feedback and uh, the work group will look at it and will incorporate it in the report. Thank you for that, Trustee Martin. Other comments? I had just Trustee a couple Osmond. of quick questions. And again, I'd echo the, my colleague on the uh, kudos to you for great work. And it's, as someone who's new to the process, it's, uh, it's great to, uh, to see such uh, hard work and dedication. Um, just quick questions. You mentioned um, revisions to the ethics um, uh, process in the different uh, 
the classified management, that that was in process. Are some of these things goals that you want to accomplish before the accreditation uh, uh, submission, or are they things that are going to be ongoing? Management is currently looking at revising its ethics AP, um, and they are in the process of, of taking into account the, the considerations of the ethics work group, and we currently have um, a manager on the ethics work group as well to, to sort of understand that recommendation and where it's coming from. So that is currently being done. I don't ha pretend to have a timeline on that um, because that is something beyond the work group's control. In terms of classified, it, it's a little bit more tricky because there are unions involved on that end. A work group is being formed within the classified Senate that incorporates union and non-union representatives to figure out exactly what sort of procedures can be put in place, what's okay with the union, and so forth. So that might take a little bit more time it's because fair. there are more bodies involved. Yeah, I think it's fair that there's an ongoing process. I, I, don't, I don't need the pressure on that one. Um, will we get some kind of summary of, of campus comments um, f on, on, the, on the report, uh, we at the board? Yeah, we can, we'll make those, public, those comments public. I'd also like to say that um, prior to the team getting here, we are allowed to send an addendum. So whatever doesn't go into the report, because we will continue to do work on all these areas after the report is going through the governance uh, approval cycle, and then we will be able to put any further documents into the addendum, so they'll see that. Okay, and the last quick question is, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to really highlight any change specifically in board policies that we need to make that will be presented to us. Are there, are there recommendations that you're going to uh, give to us in terms of board policy changes? Well, there's just the one about, um, about the I, I believe those are, that is handled through our, our board policy committee, right. and so we okay. do that on an ongoing basis. Okay, thank you. So let me say my Trustee part Brown. before you. Um, so anyhow, <laughs> so I really would like to commend Dr. Scott and uh, um, Lenore, I can't remember your last name, for this excellent job that you guys have done just getting this document together. Um, I was part of two groups mm -hmm. of many <laughs> groups, so I can truly say that I understand the amount of work and time and the challenge of working together with all of these different groups across the college. One of our problems we've always had was working together. Well, this document, to me, it represents that we're finally doing that. Yeah. And I am very, very grateful that I was part of that group. And um, we had a lot of discussions about ethics, shared governments, very hot topic. But the good thing is that everyone was able to work, get together, and this is a testament. It's a testament that when we work together, we can get things done. Good job. Thank you, and we appreciate your participation on those two groups. It was very helpful. Okay. Uh, Mr. Osling? Uh, I wanted to echo the comments of all the other trustees on, on the, the work product, and, and it it does demonstrate that we are working together. Um, and for a first draft, I think it's exceptional. I do have some uh, suggestions. And the first suggestion I would make would be for each one of the recommendations that if we could start off with a summary first and then, um, and then go into the narrative. And the summary probably is quite similar to the slides that you've already put together. Um, and that that would help me as a reader of this document, hopefully the accreditation um, uh, commission as well. And then the second recommendation that I would make is some of these um, uh, recommendations are uh, quantitative in nature. For example, recommendation number five, um, we're, we're being asked to fill permanent positions. And the proof's in the pudding. Either we filled those or we haven't, I think we could create a very uh, simple table that shows at the time the accreditation report was issued, these were the positions that were not filled, and we filled them or we're in the process of filling them, and, and that would very simply demonstrate that we're doing that. And also of that same nature, uh, recommendation number two, the evaluations. Correct. 
um, either we're catching up and getting those evaluations done or we're not, and that's a, a relatively quantitative thing that we could illustrate with a table. Correct. And thank you again for your, your hard work. Thank you. Any other comments from trustees? I also want to um, echo my colleagues. I think that this was an excellent report and all the comments that I saw back from the trustees, um, certainly very complimentary of all the hard work that's been done. A couple of things I think that you mentioned. One was on the ethics and you said that the management group didn't have their own ethics. And when the board um, put did our ethics policy, I think one of the comments made was we hope that this would become sort of a, a base of standard universal across the um, campus. So how are different groups, will they have very different ethics policies or how, how will that be managed? The recommendation that we're currently putting forward and it's already been accepted by classified, it's in the process of being reviewed by management and will come onto the agenda hopefully in the future for academic senate for faculty, is that we're going to request that the ethics procedures be divided into three parts. The first part being the adoption of the universal ethics, the summary statement that's already been approved through these various constituents groups. The second part would be specific to that particular constituent group. There might be something that arises among faculty, for example, that isn't necessarily a concern among faculty. I'm sorry, among classified. So some of it does need to differ just based on the nature of the interactions among the people in that group. Then the third part would be the procedure for dealing with alleged violations. So they will be similar to the extent that they all contain ideally those three parts. The first part being the same for everybody, ideally, again, we still need to make sure that Academic Senate would approve of that and, and we're hoping that they will do so. And then the second part, specific policies to that group. And then the third part, the procedures for dealing with violations. Those by nature will have to differ. Um, for example, a, a violation among management might be substantially different from a violation that occurs from one faculty member to another. Ideally, we would like to be able to see these groups sort of take care of their own house, so to speak. But the in, if that proves to be too much of a barrier to overcome, the ethics work group is exploring the possibility, and again, we're just exploring it at this point, of an ethics oversight committee that would be for the entire campus to have a, a more standardized process by which alleged violations are dealt with. So that is a sort of thing that we can default to if it proves necessary, but we would like to give the various groups an opportunity to deal with this matter on their own in the way that best fits their constituency. And I also know, oh, go ahead, Dr. Scott. I just did want to say, though, the group did look at the board's ethics policy and they understood the work that had gone into it and the looking at the, at the models and the CCLC, and they did use it as a model when they started their discussions. Thank you. Dr. Scott, you had another question? Right. Uh, we've got a signature page for everybody here on the, uh, okay, you're smiling. <laughs> We hope we get everybody's signature. Uh, it says October uh, 2016. Now that's when the, uh, the team is going to come back. Is that going to be the same team? Does anybody know? There will be about three or four people that were part of the previous team. Okay. Now, about when do you think it's going to be ready for a signature? You mentioned something a little while ago about uh, addendums or something like that. So, but when would the version, less any ad what you call addendums, be finalized? Well, the report. What, what's the schedule for that? Okay. The report itself will come to the board for final approval towards the end of August or early September. And that, at that time, once the board approves it, we will have all the signatures. But between uh, the, the other people, will, the others will sign it for us? What, what do you mean the others? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Right. Yeah. Faculty, and that, and, right. And then once we send it to ACCJC, between that time and the time the team gets here, mm -hmm. If there are changes, significant changes that have happened, significant improvements, we will create an addendum at that point to add the additional work that we have done. And when the team gets here, they will get to review that as well. Okay. Thank you. So um, one other comment, um, well, two other comments. So one is there was a lot of evidence quoted throughout the report. Mm -hmm. And so my question was, you know, where I assume this is going to be a digital package and we would find those would be links then to those evidence, evidences. So one was, 
you know, the, as Trustee Osterling said, you know, the, we have quantitative kinds of things that we could really measure and see how many evaluations were actually done. So is, is that how you propose to? For evaluations this? in particular, we're just waiting for that chart to be created. Um, the HR staff is, has a lot of, on its hands right now um, in terms of all the faculty and new hires, and so we're just sort of waiting for those charts to be able to be gen uh, generated. But in terms of the other evidence that's actually quoted in the evidence lists at the end of each section, that evidence does exist, and it will be posted on the PCC website um, in zip files, so it'll be available to the public um, to this download. Week. This week? Yes, this week. This week. Okay, great. And. Um, when the board had its retreat, we had Yuba, um, the Yuba Chancellor, come over and, and their trustee. And one of the things they talked about, and specific on the evaluations, was that they did some sort of a quality control. So they made sure not everybody was getting fives and then had to find out that we had to terminate people for non-performance. So um, do we have some sort of a quality control that we're planning on doing on some things? Okay, I'm not totally sure I understand the question. So, for example, specifically on evaluations, and this is the one that, that you would talk to us about, and it was just an example of how they uh, manage their process. Um, so they wanted to make sure that they didn't receive a report that all the evaluations were done and everybody got five, so the highest rank, and then find out that now we're going to be terminating okay. X number of people for non-performance. No, that's not happening. Um, the managers are reviewing the evaluations. I'm reading many, many, many evaluations. And if there's a needs improvement situation, we're saying that. Um, we're doing all the evaluations in a very good faith and honest manner. Yeah, yeah. so no rubber stamping good. No. I, I think that's what I was asking. No. Okay, um, and then the other thing I want to say besides just a great job was I was really pleased at um, some of the programs that you called out um, in the accreditation and things that were very, very high um, on the list and the chancellor's list and across the college system to be, um, to be reviewed. And of course, workforce is one of them, near and dear to my heart, but also um, the OER and the zero textbook, zero cost textbooks, I think, you know, great, so I'm glad you called those out. But very nice job, and I know I, I speak for my colleagues in saying you guys really have done a phenomenal job on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. President Wah, would you indulge me for... Cer certainly, briefly? Dr. Miller. I appreciate that. You know, when this whole thing started, it was really about climate and the issues. And one of the things that uh, Kathy Johnson, who was the uh, team chair, said to us on the way out, is that we could all just get along work together and let go of the past, we'd be a much better institution. And I think what we have here is, is, is the actual living embodiment of what she said. And under the leadership of Dr. Verdian, Dr. Foster, Dr. Chiotis, Deborah Cantararo classified, Mr. Futner with the Management Association Collective Bargaining, and certainly th 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 there's ample, ample evidence that this institution has turned around. So I want to personally thank Dr. Verdian for his leadership, which I think has really set the tone for that. And more importantly, I want to thank the board for helping to create the climate that makes it safe for everyone to come out of their foxholes and to truly participate. Because as you can see, we have an amazing faculty, staff, and management team at this institution. And if that visiting team showed up here tomorrow, we'd be ready which is months ahead of when we have to be ready. And that's a true testament. And I just wanted to say that. So thank you for indulging me. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. It certainly shows it does take a village to raise the child. So thank you all for all of the work that you've done. And we know that we're going to have a very good report in good hands. OK, so now we are on to I, the superintendent's report. Thank you, President Hua. We had uh, a wonderful visit to Washington, D.C. earlier this month as part of the annual conference of the Association of Community College Trustees and the American Association of Community Colleges. President Hua, Trustees Hilsman and Osterling, as well as Student Trustee Ban, and uh, our very own Alex uh, Buckelhide, represented our college in meetings with NASA, the National Endowment for the Arts, 
and the Small Business Administration and the Small Business uh, Development Corporation. Visits were also made to uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu, Congressman Adam Schiff, and Senator Dianne Feinstein. Those meetings were very fruitful, and we obtained a lot of very important information that we have shared with many of the our faculty members, our staff at the college, and we will be pursuing the various leads that we have had regarding grants. At the national level, there's much conversation about President Obama's focus on college promise programs, and we were pleased to be able to share our own foundation's initiative in this area. Other discussions centered on financial aid, Pell Grants, and other programs, as well as Perkins CTE grants. Last week, I had the pleasure of addressing the La Cañada Flintridge City Council, sharing with them the message that I have been taking across our district to various city councils. And that message is that PCC is open for business and is ready to work with our community partners as well as our high school districts. I'd like to thank Trustee Selvage, Dr. Bell, and uh, Ms. Damika Alexander for being present at La Cañada Flintridge City Council. Last Saturday, PCC played an important part at the Black History Month celebrations, and uh, we were present at the Northwest Pasadena Parade. Our outreach staff, our Ujima students participated in that parade. And just down the street from our very o uh, recently opened facility at Muir High School. Again, the message that we are sending is that PCC is present and PCC is here to help our communities prepare our students for the future. Two of our students have been selected by the Pasadena Sister Cities Committee to serve in the 2016 German Summer Exchange Program. The two students are Jenny Chang and Minerva Rochoa. They will be traveling to Ludwig Schaven in Germany on a six-week internship this summer. I'd like to congratulate our students, congratulate the Foreign Language Department and uh, their teachers for preparing them and making all this possible for our students and our college. I also want to highlight the leadership that uh, Dr. Brock Klein, as well as uh, Dr. Sheila Rose, are providing through our Pathways program as it relates to the basic skills work across the state. We are truly a leader when it comes to this program. The results speak for themselves, and for those of you who have read uh, the governor's budget, you will notice that we figure prominently in the top five schools in the state in uh, the movement of students from basic skills to college level uh, courses. In a few weeks, our English professor Dustin Hanvey will be traveling to Washington, D.C. with a group of, uh, of his students to tour the Capitol and visit with representatives of our government. They have read the book Freedom Writer's Diary, and they have been inspired by its message of the power of education. I'm grateful that Professor Hanvey has been able to bring together this group of students, and they have done an enormous fundraising and now they're going to go to Washington and they will be at the White House this year. They have received an invitation to visit the White House. Uh, this Sunday, uh, Ms. Uh, Crystal Colros and myself will be going to the College of the Siskiyous where I am chairing the accreditation visit uh, for the Siskiyous Community College District. And, uh, it is important that uh, faculty members, managers, staff, and trustees take part in those peer visits. And I know that Dr. Scott was on a team last, week, uh, last semester. Uh, Dr. Paul Jarrell will be on a team visiting uh, Los Angeles uh, Community College Districts in two weeks, I believe, right? Uh, Stephanie Fleming was on another team, and several of our faculty members are on visiting teams. And uh, in uh, about three weeks, the CEOs of all the community colleges of California will be meeting uh, not far from Fresno to go over the 
accreditation process in California. A whole day meeting will be devoted to the future of accreditation in California and uh, the CEOs of the 113 colleges and the districts will study the process as it is and will be making their final recommendations to the Board of Governors and the Chancellor's Office. And this concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Rudian. So at this time, we will go to announcements by shared governance representatives. So, President Morales. Hi, everyone. Good evening. First of all, I do want to apologize for not being here on our first meeting of the year, which I was very sad to not be here. But I do want to welcome our new two board members to our board and also our uh, new new elected board members. Board members. I'm really happy to see all of you guys here. So, um, something that I do want to mention, I'm super excited to say, is that our student body board um, was able to be uh, attending at the Rosemead campus today for a meeting. So we did host a meeting today there at the Rosemead campus. It was a fantastic campus. It was my first time there. I was like a little kid in a museum because it was beautiful. For those who have not gone to the Rosemead campus, I really, really um, hope you guys can attend that beautiful campus. And it's not another campus, it's our Rosemead campus, so that's fantastic. We also had a tour by our director, Raquel Torres Rethana. She was a fantastic person. She treated us like if we were at home, which we were at home, um, just in, an, in another side of our campus. Um, also, I do admire um, Dr. Torres Rethana. I see her helping our students. I was very happy to see that. We were, you know, we had a little break. She'll go downstairs and help our students, and I was so shocked and admire her a lot for that. Um, so hopefully we could have another meeting very soon at our <coughs> other campus, and hopefully we invite more of our students so they can know that we're also there for them. Um, something that I do want to mention for Lenora and Dr. Scott, they have been doing a great job for accreditation. I and some of my board members have been going to some of these meetings. Um, we've been trying to stretch as much as possible, making sure that our student rep uh, voices are being heard and also helping our accreditation. And as we can see, everybody that goes to those meetings have done a fantastic job, and hopefully we could get this through. Um, students are, um, for our hiring committees are coming up, making sure that student representatives are going to be there. Also, um, relax, mid relaxation week is coming up soon. Um, next week, so I do invite you guys to come and welcome you guys. Um, psych Psychology Services and DSPNS are working together with our student body. Um, something that I do want to throw out there is that um, our student body has approved a recommendation to increase our health fee. Um, hopefully, that will be coming up soon, and I'll be working very hard to make sure that our students know why we have made that decision, which will help not only some, but all our students here at Pasadena City College. And that's all for my reports. Again, welcome everyone, and I'm very happy to see all of you guys here. Thank you. Thank you, President Morales. So from Classified Senate, Ms. Mitchell? No report today. Thank you. From Management, Mr. Futner? I don't have a report per se, but I did want to respond to the question that uh, Trustee Hillsman brought up earlier about the recommendation number Ethics 4. Um, from our side, I can tell you that that work will be completed very, very soon. It's all but done. But just wanted to rest assured. Thank you, Mr. Fetner. From Academic Senate, Dr. Foster. Good evening, trustees. Um, I don't have something, anything terribly significant to report. Um, we're doing our business. Uh, we have a Senate equity retreat coming up that we've coordinated with uh, Dr. Cynthia Olivo. Um, it's my hope that this retreat will um, help our senators to learn about the demographics of our students and um, it preempt um, the equity issues on this campus. I would like our senators to take um, leadership roles in their areas to um, lead uh, faculty in a cycle of inquiry to learn about the students and things that we can do to help our equity issues. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I do want to thank um, Bob for um, making the uh, comment about the collegiality issues on this campus. If, if someone didn't say it, I was going to, that it's absolutely due to the leadership that we have right now, both in the union and the Senate um, and at the administration level. Um, so I, I think that that is a significant thing and I'm happy to see that we're all moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foster. So at this time, are there any reports from our trustees? So Trustee Osterling. 
um, uh, I attended the legislative summit in Washington, which Dr. Verdian has already reported on um, at length, so I won't repeat that. It was a great experience to sit in the meetings firsthand, and um, there were a number of promising opportunities that I encourage us to follow up on, and in particular, we're, we're fortunate to have JPL right in our backyard here, and um, I'm looking forward to the uh, internship opportunities that NASA and, and JPL offers and hope that we can uh, get our students into those. Thank you, and we'll certainly follow up on some of that with a legislative committee meeting. Trustee Martin? Uh, nothing to report. Trustee Selvich? Uh, yes, three brief things. Uh, we were very well received uh, at the La Cunada City Council uh, meeting. They were very impressed with the information that Dr. Verdian conveyed to them about uh, what PCC means to that community, and I can tell you it's, uh, uh, it's interesting. When I was campaigning two years ago, when I phoned into that district calling voters, I had to explain to a lot of them, you guys get to vote on how PCCs run because mm -hmm. you're in the district. Uh, and uh, uh, it, was, it was excellent uh, uh, that Dr. Verdian made that presentation. Uh, if uh, Mr. Futner will help me with the pronunciation of the artist's name, Halsa, right, okay, thank you. Uh, we've got an exhibit of uh, photography over there in the Boone Family Gallery, and uh, it's a great exhibit on uh, water uh, photography, and uh, there's gonna be an event at noon on Friday, okay, so if you can break away from whatever you're doing on uh, Friday at noon, uh, we'll have an event there. Yeah, if I may, that's, that is the presentation by the artists and residents of a work to Pasadena City College, that's part of the deal. You know, that has been going on for nearly 30 years, so we've, and, we've, we've established yeah. quite a collection. Yeah. <laughs> in, in addition to the uh, photography, there's also a brochure uh, with a, an essay on water, which is uh, very informative, so it's, it's a real topical thing uh, these days. And finally, uh, my phone is uh, not working right now, so I don't know <laughs> how we're doing over here at the, uh, at the gym, but we've got a basketball game going on right now. Does anybody know? Uh, we're, this is the first uh, round of the playoffs, women's basketball. Well, perhaps someone can look up that score and then call it out <laughs> from reports. Um, yes, Trustee Bond, do you have a report? Yes. Um, as mentioned, two weeks ago I attended the National Legislative Summit in Washington, D.C., along with the Associated Students VP for Student Services, Julia Russo. While speaking with our representatives in Congress, I was pleasantly surprised about how supportive they were of community college issues. Among some of the things discussed were grants, counseling services, and veterans itch issues, which are continually being improved upon. Today, I accompanied the Associated Students as we held the executive board meeting at the Rosemead campus. Dr. Dr. Torres Ratana gave us a wonderful tour of the facilities, and we discussed ways in which we could collaborate in the future. A topic of discussion was the way Rosemead classes are listed when registering. Sometimes students are unaware that their class is held at the Rosemead campus when scheduling and do not take time, do not take into account the amount of time it takes to get to the Rosemead site. Um, some students even go to the Rosemead campus looking for the R building. So <laughs> one of the discussions we had with Dr. Rotana was having a shuttle to the Rosemead campus. Perhaps a shuttle from the Sierra Madre station to Rosemead is something PCC can have in the future to include access for students taking public transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Vaughn. Trustee Brown. Um, no report. Trustee Hilsman. Well, I just wanted to say after my two or three months of service on the board, I wanted to thank so much Dr. Verdi and Dr. Miller and all the administrative staff and faculty, as well as my colleagues on the board who've been so supportive of me and, 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 and our new, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Mr. Jim Osterling. Um, I also wanted to say that we had very productive meetings in Sacramento on the state level and in Washington, as has been mentioned. 
Um, one of the things that we probably don't realize as well as we might on this campus is the importance of community college on a national level. It's something that is going to be a topic of conversation, particularly this year during the election, presidential election, uh, when it well, and you can see uh, on the national level and on the state level all the enthusiasm and interest there is in developing the opportunities that are presented by community college for a great number of students. So I would just echo, um, having been here for only a couple of months, uh, how impressed I am by the, all the things that you're doing for the students and how important this is, not just for Pasadena or even California, but for our, our whole nation. So uh, I, I commend all of you for the great work and I thank you for, your, for uh, helping me initiate on the board. Thanks. So I want to call to all the trustees' attention um, in your brown folder there, or in, our, in your inserts, there were a couple of things. One was a master calendar of reports that we can expect that would be uh, scheduled for future board meetings, and we are going to be updating that with uh, reports that are requested as well as critical timelines such as president's evaluation, the board's evaluation, uh, self-evaluation. So. Um, so it's a work in process, so I hope you will all um, give input to that because so, we want to make this work for everyone. Uh, the second thing, it's in the brown folder, is um, I put together an activities note so I don't go on and on about all the things that I wanted to talk to you, everyone about, and that way you have um, information. But I got the idea from um, the league, and I was talking to several of the trustees regarding their accreditation. They said, you know, we just put down some bullet points and we shoot it to the board secretary and ask them to put it together. And what it does then is it documents the board's activities in the community, uh, which then helps us in accreditation because it shows we're doing what we're supposed to do. So I hope this is helpful to you. So the things I just want to call is thank the um, community events, or just thank the, uh, the college for coming out to support the South, the South Pasadena Mayor's Prayer Breakfast, which is the first ever, and it was to raise funds for their um, uh, their emergency services. Um, and then also, we had a, uh, a Lee's Family Peace Plaza dedication, and that was attended by Selv uh, Trustee Selvage, Brown, and Hillsman, so, and really a, a wonderful event, and if you ever have a chance to go by the uh, Sculpture Garden and see that dedication, the Lee's family was um, a very interesting family and, and gave a contribution to PCC, but more than that, they were very, very involved in uh, the health of the community and uh, the health of the college. Um, I want to call your attention to several upcoming events, which is the AUPI Imposium, and then Dr. Russell Frank is working on the International Leadership Foundation, which scholarships several of our students in leadership. And then the LAXA events, and I won't go over those because I've gone over them several times, but I know Trustee Osterling will be attending the, uh, the upcoming one on the voting rights and then we'll have workforce on 425. Um, I did want to let you know that I was um, uh, requested by Vice Chancellor Tina to, um, to represent the trustees uh, on the IEPI, the uh, Institutional Effectiveness Program Policy and Procedures Roundtable. So I look forward to getting any input from any of my, uh, any of my colleagues. And um, also on the legislative update, so that I think that sufficient information has been given out about that. I have listed the, um, the actual link on workforce on doing what matters. So I invite the trustees to go to that link. It lists all of the recommendations as well as the next steps. And then uh, all of those, it will also have a primer on how to use the uh, Launch Board 2.0, which will then report out any of the, uh, the data that we're getting from the colleges who have launched that. Um, as can be expected, the two big topics at the league meeting were the workforce, but also the ACCJC and the accreditation. Um, and what was said to the, the trustees is um, there is an April timeline plan which will be going before the Board of Governors. Um, that timeline is to, um, the plan is to detail out when the community colleges will be moving over to a new accreditor and how they will be moving over. And, uh, Vice, and Chancellor Harris spoke very passionately about this particular issue and also asked all the trustees to please support 
their superintendents, chancellors, and presidents in, um, in supporting this effort. The most, um, I think, compelling reason, um, I didn't realize this until I went to Sacramento, is that we are the only region that is actually, um, our accreditation team only accredits two-year colleges. All other regions accredit both two-year and four-year colleges. And so um, you may have seen the letter where RACCJC is now put on probation and also was uh, denied uh, the ability to accredit a four-year uh, higher, uh, four-year degree institution. And so as the thought is as community colleges move um, closer towards the higher ed institutions, we move towards the baccalaureate degrees that we really need an accreditation, an accreditor who will um, understand and articulate to four-year um, colleges. So I'm sure Dr. Verdian will have more information and we'll be keeping um, tabs on that, but that is the news from the trustees, and so I urge all of you to be familiar with the issues. Uh, one of the things that came up um, that Trustee Bond and I attended in uh, D.C. was um, a meeting with Senator Boxer. So it was um, about five, the Chancellor's Office as well as um, three other community colleges. And um, Senator Boxer spoke very passionately about her, um, uh, one of her uh, um, initiatives, and that is to ask for a 24 by 7 rape counselor on every uh, campus, and so she's willing to go out and to advocate for that. So I think this works in conjunction with the um, the California legislative bill under um, under Quirk, so the Quirk bill, and it's on a, uh, a watch right now. But we'll discuss that more in legislative. And the other things that came up, um, both with the congressional representatives that we met with, with Representative Chu and uh, Schiff, were the um, the request for information on how we were doing moving the VA clinic, medical clinic forward. So I know I've gotten a lot of requests and for information from the communities, and I'm sure other trustees have received the same thing. So what I've asked, and I've asked Dr. Verdian to, um, the process will be that I will call a subcommittee, the veteran subcommittee, which was initiated by Dr. Fellow two years ago, and uh, we will review the issues and then it will go before the entire board for a full vote. But I've asked Dr. Verdian to make sure that administration has all of the information ready to present for the board because it does not serve as well if the board tries to make recommendations without full information. So I've asked Dr. Verdian if you wanted to add any more to that. The information we have received from uh, our legal counsel is that uh, under California law, community colleges cannot enter into revocable licenses with uh, federal agencies. And of course, we can enter into that if we want to, but then we will be exposing ourselves to litigation. That's the main issue that we have currently. There are two other possibilities known as the Joint Powers Authority and also the Joint Use Agreement. And uh, these two are two possibilities that uh, the federal agencies cannot really consider with a community college. So Dr. Verdian, I think, is working very closely with Congresswoman Chu's staff. They're working with the VA and they're looking at what are other pathways. And I believe other city officials Yes. have also entered and into assisting. Mm -hmm. We have over um, almost a thousand PCC student veterans and so that was the genesis of us looking at a way to assist them and so um, we are very hopeful that we can still continue to provide something that will assist them. So um, I just wanted to give everyone sort of a little update on the up, that upcoming meeting which probably would have come under future agenda items. Um, and then just very, very quickly, I wanted to congratulate um, AS and the students who came with us to Sacramento and, um, and Dean Cobb because of your efforts. You know um, Assemblymember Holden has now authored Assembly Bill 2222 for the uh, student pass, so good job. So we're looking forward to that. And then um, we have scheduled coffees uh, with the board in Creveling, and so I have opened those to all board members to attend, so these will be open board, open meetings. On March 17th, we will be meeting with classified, and then on March 24th, we will be meeting with faculty. And then we have um, 
a future meeting that will not be an open meeting uh, with the Academic Senate. Okay, and that's my announcements. And then we have future board meetings, so we do have a continued change from, uh, I guess it was a domino effect from rescheduling some of our meetings. So we will not meet the first Wednesday of March, but we will meet on March 16th. And then we will, the next two meetings in April will be joint meetings, one with the Associated Students and then with Pasadena Unified. Pasadena Unified. So um, if AS wants any input from the board, please let me know and we'll get that. And I know Trustee Brown has been um, getting, collecting information and will be working with Pasadena Unified. So are there any requests for future agenda items? At this time, the board is now adjourned. Mm-hmm.